Just a few years ago, Robinson Cano seemed like a lock for the Hall of Fame. He was on pace for 3,000 hits and cemented himself as this generation's greatest second baseman. He was the king of New York, signed one of the biggest contracts in sports history, and was still a great player through the 2017 season. Since then, he's been part of one of the most controversial trades in recent memory, cut from multiple big league rosters, and failed not one, but two PED tests, which have all but destroyed his Hall of Fame chances. Robbie Cano built his legacy from the ground up, becoming a hero for me and many others before his pride led to a steep collapse. So where did it all go wrong? Named to honor Jackie Robinson, Robinson Cano grew up in San Pedro de Macorís in the Dominican Republic. His father Jose pitched professionally for about two decades, bouncing around the minors, playing in Taiwan, and even earning a complete game victory with the Astros in one of just six major league appearances. By the time his career was over, Robbie was garnering big league interests of his own as a junior in high school. Yankees scout Gordon Blakely signed Robbie for over $100,000 as an 18 year old in 2001. Blakely noticed Cano's incredible balance at the plate and sweet swing, signing him in hopes that he'd grow stronger and hit for power with age. And what a find he was for the Yankees. As a team in the lower minors, Cano didn't really stuff the stat but he improved both his offense and defense year after year, finding himself in AAA to start the 2005 season. Finding someone as talented as Robbie in a sea of international prospects is lucky, but the fact that the Yankees kept him was nothing short of miraculous. He was nearly traded as part of the A-Rod deal before the 2004 season, but the Rangers chose Joaquin Arias as their player to be named later. Who's that, you may ask? Exactly first bullet dodged. In June of 2004, Carlos Beltran became available, and it was clear that Bernie Williams was aging out of his everyday role in center field. The Yanks even moved Cano to third base to get the Royals to bite, but they turned down the offer in favor of Houston's Mark Tian centered package. A few weeks later, the struggling D-backs considered moving Randy Johnson, and the Yankees offered up any prospect in their farm for the big unit. Some D-back scouts wanted Cano, but their front office decided against trading Johnson, and Cano once again remained with the team that signed him. Blakely and the Yankees liked him more than most organizations, but were still shopping him like he was on the clearance rack. I don't think anyone expected what was to come. Robbie Cano got the call in May of 2005, winning the Yankees' starting second base job just over a month into Tony Womack's two-year contract. He hit nearly 300 and finished second in Rookie of the Year voting, and was now teammates with both Rodriguez and Johnson. He didn't walk very much, finishing in the bottom three of qualified batters in terms of walk rate, and he wasn't great in the field, but he showed the Yankees that he could swing the bat. By the end of his rookie campaign, Cano was batting sixth in the Yankees' loaded lineup, and he made his mark on his first postseason swing. Cano shoots one into deep left field, Anderson back. Robinson Cano has delivered for New York. He hit another RBI double early during Game 2, then another to tie up Game 3, but the Yankees dropped both games. The roster was remodeled in pursuit of defense and speed after their defeat to the Angels, but Cano was now a cornerstone rather than an expendable trade chip. He truly ascended during his second and third seasons, winning a Silver Slugger in 2006 and evolving from a defensive liability into one of the best defenders in baseball in 2007. He was voted an All-Star starter during his sophomore season, but he missed the game because of a hamstring injury. After his return from the IL, he wouldn't miss another game due to injury for over a decade. Before his extremely underrated 2007 campaign, he gave up his number 22 to Roger Clemens, choosing to wear 24 to honor Jackie Robinson. That season, he put up nearly 7 wins above replacement, but didn't win a gold glove or silver slugger, wasn't an all-star, and didn't get any MVP votes. But the Yankees understood they had something special, and they locked him down to a 4-year extension with 2 additional options for 2012 and 2013. That contract wasn't looking great after 2008. Cano put up a career-low average in OPS and homered just 14 times in 159 games. The Yanks missed out on the play for the first time in over a decade. Although Cano knocked in the last RBI in Yankee Stadium history, he was looking more like a role player destined for years at the bottom of the lineup than a future star. Something was in the air in 2009. I don't know if it was the new stadium, the new roster additions, or just lightning in a bottle, but everything came together into nearly a perfect season. In a lineup where everyone was hitting, Cano nearly mirrored his double play partner's production, except with more power and less walks. He found his home run stroke, elevating the ball into the short porch more than ever. He had some memorable moments, like his walk-off homer that continued a seemingly endless parade of big hits for that year's Yankees. But his biggest play of all came on November 4th. To the second baseman, Cano. The Yankees are back on Champions for the 27th time. 
On a personal note, this is around the time I really began to fall in love with baseball. I went to my first Yankee game in 2006, and Robbie Cano went 2 for 4 with a double and stolen base. I was there at the last game at the house that Ruth built. I stayed up late and watched Cano field the final out of the 2009 World Series. I played second base in Little League, and Cano was my favorite team's second baseman, so naturally, he was the guy that I always looked up to. There was just something about that swing, man, he just cut through pitches like butter. It was so smooth, everything he did on the field was smooth, it was almost like he wasn't trying sometimes. I went to a bunch of games with my dad during this era of the Yankees, and he always made sure to bring me early so I could watch the team warm up. My dad always pointed out Jeter and Cano's long toss. Cano would make his way back to the 314 sign down right field line, and Jeter would hang out around home plate. Jeter held his glove out to the side, and Cano hit his target without fail every single time. It was just so casual, another day at the office for them, but to me, to 7 year old me, these men were deities. When Robbie fielded the final out of that World Series, he hadn't even entered his prime yet. From 2010 to 2016, nobody played more games or got more hits than Cano, and he cemented himself in a league of his own in terms of offensive middle infield production. He ascended in 2010, finishing the year with 29 homers and a 141 OPS+, plus, all while winning his first gold glove. Joe Torre once compared a rookie Cano to Rod Carew, and he was forced to backtrack. The media didn't like him putting some kid in the same conversation as a baseball legend. Well, maybe they were onto something, because Rod Carew never had a year this good in his 20s. Cano finished third in MVP voting with an 8-win season, only behind Miguel Cabrera and Josh Hamilton. The Yankees handled the Twins during the Division Series before facing off against the Rangers during the ALCS. The series quickly became a head-to-head -head matchup between the most and third most valuable players in the American League. Hamilton got to CC Sabathia early with a 3-run homer. Down 5 0 entering the 7th, Cano homered, then went on to tie the game with a base hit in the 8th. Right back up the middle. This is gonna tie the game! Yankees win 6 5. Hamilton drew four walks and swiped two bags. The Yankees wanted absolutely nothing to do with him, but the Rangers still got to Phil Hughes for seven runs. Cano hit his solo homer in the 6th, but the game was already well out of reach. Series tied 1 1. Hamilton homered in the first, then started a five-run rally with a double in the ninth. Cano was held hitless and the Yankees were shut out. Cano started the scoring with a solo shot, but Hamilton homered twice off the Yankees bullpen in the Rangers' comeback victory. Despite Cano's two for three with a homer and a walk, the Yankees dropped their third straight. Double trouble. That ball is scorched to right, back to the wall, back to back! The Yankees dominated to stay alive thanks to another Cano homer and holding Josh Hamilton to just a single. Whichever MVP plays better tonight might decide the outcome of the game. Cano just couldn't keep it up, going 0 for 4 in the Rangers clincher. Hamilton drew three intentional walks and still somehow went 1 for 1. Their final stats from this series are absolutely insane. Cano's breakout in 2010 began his ascent into superstardom. He'd been in the league for six full seasons, but he'd always been more of a role player in the bottom half of the lineup. With A-Rod and Jeter both aging, Cano was quickly becoming the player to watch in New York. Don't get it twisted, Jeter's pursuit of 3,000 hits was the biggest event of the 2011 season. But just two days later, Cano had the spotlight all to himself. Don't it sound legendary? 
Liven up the resurrected dead and buried This for niggas who ain't satisfied with secondary This for my sisters who ain't satisfied with secretary uh, I'm blowing up and bitch I'm still me But what's the cost to live your dreams do you feel me Everything glittering ain't what you think it will be Funny how money chains and whips make me feel free I'm starring in this bitch and yeah I write the show Fuck the haters I'm headed to that place you like to go They say what you fighting for this game is on life support And Gary Coma just passed Life is short Bitch I'm about to blow up Look I'm about to blow up Yeah Got to the club early just to get a friend Wait for hoes to show up Man nah, But now it's bottles at the tables Bring them out as one You know what? <laughs> Bitch, I'm about to blow up. Left side, left side, hey. <laughs> right side, right side, uh huh. Left side, left side, hey. Spiritual, how they got these niggas on the TV selling miracles. You mean to tell me everything gonna be fine if I call your hotline and pay $29.99? Shit. Well, damn, why ain't you say so? Take the check and ask God to multiply all my pesos and erase my number out the phones of these fake hoes. I take the number just in case, but now it's case closed. To you niggas biting my flows and my subject matter. You never be me, partner, so it don't fucking matter. You try to be in your career or see funerals. And be you, that's when it sounds beautiful. <laughs> then maybe you can blow up. And maybe you can blow up. If you're still here and you like this video, hit that subscribe button down below. It's free and you can unsubscribe anytime you want, and it helps me out a ton, so it would be much appreciated. And special thanks to Storm and Historian for contributing to this video. It wouldn't have been possible without them, so make sure to check out their channels in the description. His home run derby victory, paired with back-to-back -back big postseasons, turned Cano into a national baseball superstar. And in 2012, he got even better. He had another 8-win, gold glove, silver slugger season, complete with a career-high 33 homers and a 148 OPS+. The guy the Yankees tried to trade away three times in a year was now their best player. He finished fourth during one of the most stacked MVP votes ever, behind the likes of Triple Crown Miggy and rookie Mike Trout. He was the most feared bat in the Yankees' order drawing more walks than ever, including a team-high 10 intentional walks. The 2012 ALCS was a rematch against Miggy and the Tigers, but the aging Yankees were running on fumes. Their window snapped shut during the 12th inning of Game Grounded. 1. Jeter will not be able to make a play there at the corners. He's had all kind of trouble with the left ankle. Cano struggled mightily in what would unknowingly be his final postseason. Entering the final option year of his contract, the Yankees tried to further extend Cano before the 2013 season, but no deal was completed. The 2013 Yankees were an injury-riddled mess with only two above-average hitters who played over 60 games. Of course, Cano was one of them. During a season where the Yankees led the league in DL stints, Cano played in 160 games, which had been a season average since 2007. Durability like this is rare in today's game. Cano missed no more than three games during each of his last seven years with the Yankees. His 2013 was another elite season at the plate and he finished fifth in MVP voting, his fourth year in a row in the top six. As we know, baseball is not a one-man sport, and no matter how well Robbie played, he couldn't carry the Yankees into the postseason. With no playoffs for just the second time in two decades, 12-year-old me nervously awaited the pending contract negotiations.
Looking back, it makes perfect sense why the Yankees couldn't come close to matching Seattle's mega offer. New York gave A-Rod 10 years and $275 million when he was in his early 30s. At the time of this negotiation, A-Rod was coming off his second major hip surgery, his production was down even when he was healthy, and he had a year-long steroid suspension looming. Oh, and the Yankees had him on their books for another four seasons. If George Steinbrenner was still alive, I don't think Cano would have ever changed uniforms. But his son Hal didn't want to put all the eggs in one basket and risk another Albatross contract as soon as they were out from under A-Rod's deal, even though Cano's ego wasn't nearly as big of a concern. The Yankees offered him 7 years and $175 million to stay in pinstripes, which was just dwarfed by Seattle's 10-year, $240 million offer. So many Yankees fans were angry at him for leaving. This doesn't happen to us. We don't lose our franchise players to mid-market teams. We're supposed to do this to teams like Seattle. For once, the bully got bullied. In his return to the stadium, the Yankees' best player for the last half decade got two straight minutes of booze before his strikeout set off thunderous applause, all because he made an obvious free agency decision. Even as a kid, I couldn't fault the man for taking the extra money in security. This reception just isn't fair after all he did for the Yankees, but all it really means is that Yanks fans were hurt by him leaving. They knew they lost a great one. Yeah. Oh, Listen, about that, right? Here's what happened. <laughs> When Robinson Cano put pen to paper ahead of the 2014 season, he was an established superstar with an open path towards Cooperstown. Through the 2013 season, only 67 players had accumulated at least 44 career war in their first nine seasons. 53 of these players are in the Hall of Fame, which doesn't include players like Albert Pujols, Ichiro Suzuki, Barry Bonds, and Alex Rodriguez. Cano's mega deal tied Albert Pujols for the third largest deal in MLB history, a giant statement made by a Mariners franchise that hadn't seen the playoffs in over a decade. However, were the Mariners the right team to give Cano this contract? The 2013 Mariners were an average hitting team, while the pitching staff was one of the three worst in the league. In reality, the pitching staff was extremely top-heavy as Felix Hernandez and Hisashi Iwakuma were one of the best one-two punches in the league. With top prospects Taiwan Walker and James Paxton making successful big league debuts, they were poised for bigger roles in the near future. As for the lineup, it was mostly a squad of young big leaguers like Kyle Seeger, Justin Smoke, Michael Saunders, and Mike Zunino. With Cano instantly becoming the anchor of this lineup, the question was how quickly could he adjust with his new team. Well, let's just say it didn't take too long. He reached on an error by Swisher. Oh, look out. It took only a couple months for Cano to hit like his normal self, which led to his fifth straight All-Star appearance and an overall great season. While Cano lost out on a silver slugger for the first time in half a decade, he was continuing to build his case for Cooperstown. By 2014, only 59 players had surpassed 50 career war by their 10th season. Cano was now one of them. If we limit this list to only second baseman, Cano became only the fourth second baseman to achieve this milestone. Two of these players are Hall of Famers, while Chase Utley becomes eligible in 2024. However, even with Cano building his case and the Mariners ending the season with their first record over 500 since 2009, the Mariners missed out on the playoffs. How? Well, for the most part, the Mariners were not predicted to make the playoffs as teams like the Rangers, Angels, and Athletics made the AL West arguably the toughest division in the league. Despite the Mariners pitching staff miraculously becoming one of the best in the league, the Athletics beat out the Mariners for the final wildcard spot by only one game. No one knew it yet, but this was the best shot the Mariners had at reaching the postseason in the Robinson Cano era. For the next few years, Cano regressed quite a bit, but he still did enough to earn two more All-Star appearances, including his 2016 season where he hit a career-high 39 home runs, becoming one of only six second basemen to hit this many home runs. At the same time, the Mariners as a team just weren't getting it done. 
the 2015 Mariners had one of the league's best offenses, but their pitching staff heavily regressed to what it looked like in 2013. The 2016 Mariners were actually better than the 2014 squad. Well, at least that's what the stats say. Unfortunately, in a results-based business, the 2016 Mariners were just another team that couldn't make the playoffs. Whether it was due to injuries or simply not showing up when it counted, the first four years of the Robinson Cano era had been a failure. But with Cano earning his eighth All-Star appearance, surpassing 60 career war and 300 career home runs, Cano was further solidifying his Hall of Fame case. As the 23rd player to surpass 300 home runs and 64 war after 13 seasons played, Cano had reached a point where it was tougher to not end up in the Hall of Fame. The only players that aren't in the Hall of Fame under these parameters are these five players. Two of them will be first ballot Hall of Famers, while the other two may never see Cooperstown because of past scandals. Cano now finds himself among one of these groups. The news broke on May 15th, 2018. Cano tested positive for a diuretic called furosemide, which can be used as a masking agent, which helps the body rid itself of evidence of doping. Cano, who only missed 38 total games since being called up in 2005, was suspended for 80 games. Everything he had accomplished, all that work he put in, all of his awards and all of his numbers, were they all fraudulent? Cano accepted the suspension, although he stated that he never cheated and the diuretic he was using was prescribed by a doctor in the DR. There was definitely some room for doubt, and I didn't want to believe that an idol of mine was playing dirty. I don't think his Hall of Fame chances or legacy were completely tarnished on that day. Just look at his then-teammate Nelson Cruz. He was suspended in 2013, but he's played really well while clean since then. Even though he probably doesn't have a real Hall of Fame case, he certainly turned the positive test into an afterthought. Cano had 5 more years left on his deal and only 530 more hits before reaching 3000. All he had to do was put together a couple more solid seasons and stay healthy to be known as a member of the 3000 hit club rather than a cheater. And if his return in 2018 was any indication, he could still play. He put up a really solid half season, coming back from the suspension without missing a beat. But the Mariners missed out on the playoffs and they decided to shake up their roster. Cano was coming back to New York, although this time, he'd be wearing blue and orange. The Mets made waves when they sent top prospect Jared Kelnick amongst others to the Mariners for Cano and Edwin Diaz. The trade was controversial for a few reasons. First of all, Mets GM Brody Van Wagenen was Cano's agent when he signed with Seattle, which seems like a conflict of interest. Second of all, Kelnick was an extremely touted prospect and the Mets traded him for a reliever and an aging $100 million contract. These were the Wilpons Mets, they didn't have that much money to go around, so fans weren't thrilled with the idea of paying Cano that much money as he approached 40 years old. But the worst part of the trade was that Cano and Diaz both stunk in 2019. Diaz blew save after save because of juice fly balls just barely getting out of the park. But that's a story for another time. Cano was on and off the IL all year and he just wasn't any good when he was playing. The trade looked horrible entering 2020, but Cano wanted to prove that he wasn't done yet. He bounced back, putting up good power numbers and looking like his old self throughout the shortened season. Maybe the down 2019 was a result of his nagging injuries or his unusually low BABIP. Maybe the trade wasn't so bad after all. Diaz bounced back as well, and Cano was a solid bat and veteran presence. Hell, he even looked like he'd be a big part of the 2021 Mets lineup. I think that Robinson Cano just stole the title of the biggest a-hole and the biggest jerk in all of baseball because the biggest dummy that I can think of Robinson Cano had to go out and take steroids for a second time in his career and get busted. It was over. Not only had Cano missed out on about $36 million in 240 games because of his PED usage, he missed out on his chance to get his 3,000th hit, his chance to make the Hall of Fame, and his chance to go down as a baseball legend. It's hard to look back at the 2020 season as anything but a tainted fluke. His last good year other than that was 2018, the year of his first suspension. How long was he cheating for? How long were the PEDs sustaining his performance? Was he really a great player and hard worker? It's impossible to look the other way after this one. There were no excuses after the second failed test. He knew he fucked up. He knew he let people down. He was now 2013 A-Rod. He didn't fight it out in public to protect his ego, but there's no telling the truth from the lies. He was sitting nearly 400 hits away from 3,000 with just two years left on his deal and no PEDs to propel his performance. This was just devastating as a baseball fan and as a Cano fan. Greatness is fleeting, especially in sports. 
Going out desperate to recapture your former glory is sadder than going out naturally. Had Cano signed that 7 year deal with the Yankees and failed a second drug test in 2020, we probably never would have heard from him again, but he still had 2 years left, and he broke camp with a spot on the 2022 Mets roster. You probably know what happened next. After 12 dreadful games with the Mets, he was mercifully released. The Padres picked him up and he lasted exactly 12 more games in San Diego, where he somehow played even worse. You've probably seen clips of Cano playing in El Paso wearing the Chihuahua Spongebob Night jerseys. This was the inspiration for the video. Video, just take a look at the thumbnail. I was devastated to think about how far this man, this idol of mine, had fallen. Just as I was wrapping up this video, Cano got traded and promoted to the Braves roster. He played well in El Paso and got another shot to stick in the majors. I don't know how long he's gonna last, he could be cut by next week for all I know, but there's one thing I know for sure, he'll be playing baseball somewhere. He could have gotten home with his hundreds of millions after being cut by the Mets or the Padres, but he grinded out a month wearing goofy jerseys and taking the bus to and from El Paso. He loves this game, and personally, I'm still rooting for him. Even though he made mistakes, I think Robinson Cano will cherish every last moment on the diamond. Regardless of his legacy, when all is said and done, nobody will be able to tell him that he was not passionate.